Sabil, friends of Sabil in Los Angeles County. So that's great. So without further, and Jim will introduce our speakers. Jim, would you come on up? First, an administrative word, turn off your cell phones if they're still on. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to welcome you. Sabil is one of the co-sponsors of this event, and I would like to recognize some of the other co-sponsors of this event. And if you're a, you are a member of any of these groups, would you please stand so we can acknowledge your support? Uh, we've got <clears throat> the Cousins Club of Orange County, the Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace, Jewish Voice for Peace Los Angeles, One Global Family Foundation, we've got Seville Los Angeles and Seville Orange County, <clears throat> Unitarian Universalists for Justice in the Middle East, a Committee of Unitarian Universalist Church in Anaheim, and LA Jews for Peace. Did I miss anybody? I think I covered just about the whole audience. <laughs> Our speaker today is Miko Pelin. Miko is an Israeli Jew who has a most unusual story to tell us this afternoon. Miko's family history includes the founding of Israel which was recently celebrated on May 15th, the same day that six million Palestinians around the world acknowledge al nakba the catastrophe. And we'll talk, he'll talk more about how these are intertwined. Miko's grandfather is one of the signatories of the declaration that established the state of Israel. And his father was a general who gained fame in the wars of 1948 and 1967. So it would not be surprising for you to assume that Nico support, supported the Israeli state. So how did he become a supporter of the Zionist dream and evolved into today where he is a leader in defending Palestinian human rights? and we'll listen to his story on how he made that voyage. Vico? Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. It's a pleasant little crowd, pleasant little place here. It's nice to be here. Um, uh, like, you, like you heard, I'm uh, originally an Israeli. Um, I have a book that I just came out of. And the book relates the story, basically, that you just heard me in the introduction, uh, which is a story of my family roots, which were very, very patriotic, very Zionist, it's probably as Zionist and patriotic as you can get. Um, and then a journey that I began about 12 years ago as an Israeli into Palestine. And um, the way the book is laid out, it, uh, it's laid out kind of almost, almost completely chronologically. So the story of the development of the State of Israel, the story of the development of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and then my own personal journey are kind of weaved in and out of each other. But every, you know, every story begins with somebody who decides to get up and go. I know every story, a lot of stories. And in my case, it was my, my maternal grandfather, who was uh, born and raised in uh, Belarus in Belarus, which is a predominantly, was a predominantly Jewish city. And he did several things that were uncharacteristic of Jews in the diaspora. He, um, he was able to go to medical school and become a doctor, which was very difficult for Jews at the time. He joined the Russian army and became an officer, which was also very rare. Jewish, Jewish people typically did not serve in militaries. And then he decided that, like several other people of his generation, Jews of his generation, he decided that the solution for the 
the problem of Jewish persecution, or persecution of Jews in Eastern Europe was Zionism, or the return of these people to their historic homeland in the land of Israel. And to that end, he went, he, he, um, he traveled to Jewish communities around the world and spoke, and he himself, once he married my grandmother, who was also a doctor, immigrated to Israel in the, the 1920s, to Palestine, I should say. And they built a home in Jerusalem. Um, my, on my father's side, the, 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 this is not quite the same kind of story. There were more working class people that ended up also opting for Zionism, realizing that there was no, or feeling that there was no other solution for Jews in Eastern Europe. And so they also, my grandparents on that side, immigrated uh, to Palestine. And then both my parents, of course, the consequence of that was that both my parents were born in Palestine. And uh, this is after World War I, of course, and so we're talking about the beginning of the, of the British Mandate of Palestine. And um, when my father grew up, a kind of education, a kind of indoctrination, actually both my parents received, was a very, again, it was a very patriotic Zionist education, which said that this is our land and we need to um, develop our own homeland here, our own state here as Jews. And there was no real, there was no real discussion or debate about the fact that there are other people living in this land. This is our land, and we need to come here and we need to reclaim. Now my father joined the Haganah, which was the Jewish militia at the time, as a young man, while well, still in high school. Um, and originally the intention was to fight off the British, get the British out of there. But eventually it became the force with which the Zionist movement fought the, fought the Palestinians. And then um, he remained in the so once, once the state of Israel was created, of course, the officers became, or the, the Haganah became the Israeli army. After 1948, when the state was established, he remained as an officer, and then he didn't retire until after uh, the Six Day War, so 1968. Um, so as a child, well, you know, my very first impressions were, you know, my father was a general, you know, and the whole myth that comes with that, the entire, the entire uh, weight of that, which is huge, um, and of course the sense that we are right, that we are just, that we are small but we're strong, we're the David and the David and Goliath thing, and therefore we will always prevail. This is a very big part. Of, uh, of what I grew up with. Now, as I, as I was working on the book, or even before I started working on the book, as my journey into Palestine began, or when it began and then evolved, I realized that the story that I was brought up with is not necessarily the only story, and maybe not even a true story at all. And as I my journey continued, and I started working on the book, which, which was, took about four or five years to put together. What I realized were, was that several of the stories, the main stories, the mythological stories that Israelis grew up with, are actually myths. <clears throat> now, I, t I say this now, you know, perfectly calm, but the process of realizing it was a very difficult, very painful, and very long process. Um, I owe it, I owe a great deal of my ability to have done that. I owe it to the fact that in San Diego I was able to find a group, um, it was called the Jewish Palestinian Dialogue Group, the San Diego Jewish Palestinian Dialogue Group, where for the first time I was able to sit among Jews and Palestinians in a setting that was perfectly normal in somebody's living room and just talk. Because even though I grew up in Jerusalem, which is supposedly a mixed city, a united city, I never met Palestinians. And the reason I never met Palestinians is because Jerusalem is completely segregated. It's united as an administrative unit, perhaps, but it's completely segregated in terms of Israelis and Palestinians, as is the rest of Palestine and Israel. Completely, completely segregated. Um, but I remember the first time I realized that this was, I was 39 years old, I was living in America, and that was the very first time that I was actually able to sit with Palestinians and just talk and hear what they had to say. 
And uh, like I said, what I discovered was along the way, or towards the end of the way, I should say, is the three main myths upon which, there's almost like the three pillars upon which the state of Israel exists in, the mind, in our minds as Israelis and Jews are not true. The first myth is the myth of what happened in 1948. The myth of the establishment of the state of Israel. The myth of what we call the War of Independence. The story that Israelis grew up with and the story that Americans grew up with too and is repeated here by politicians like it's, um, like it's, you know, like this is something that everybody knows, like it's, you know, God-given truth, is that the small Jewish community in Palestine at the time was finally given an opportunity to become a state. And when that happened, the Arab armies invaded, intending to destroy them and drive them into the sea. This is the story. This is the narrative. This is the myth. Now, it's very interesting when you take a look at the two communities in Palestine prior to the establishment of the state of Israel. You had a community, you had the Jewish community, which was somewhere around half a million people, that were able to develop um, their own little mini state, really. They had their own healthcare system, they had their own education system, they revived their ancient language. They did a lot of things which were quite remarkable. Um, the, you know, the Hebrew language was basically nobody used it for 2,000 years. My mother was born in Jerusalem in 1926, already went to first grade learning Hebrew, in Hebrew, in other words. There was an entire education system, which is quite interesting. Parallel to that, there was a Palestinian state in the making. Of course, the Palestinians were, you know, double if not triple the number of Jews. You know, they had no nearly 0.3 or no 0.4 Palestinian Arabs who lived in Palestine at the time, and they too had their own institutions, and their own class, and their own cities, and everything. But the one thing that the Jewish community developed that the Palestinian community never did was the military force. A very strong, a very dedicated, a very well-trained, and a very well-indoctrinated militia, of which my father was a part. Now, in 1947, November 29, 1947, the United Nations resolution to partition Palestine into two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state. On the face of it, you think, great, great accomplishment. The perfect solution. Except that when you look at the plan itself and you look at the way they divided the country, you see it was absolutely absurd. I don't want to get into that now, but it was completely absurd, and I don't think anybody accepted that that particular plan was ever going to work. And the story that we were told is that we, the Jews, we, the Zionists, accepted the plan and were ready to move on, but here we were being attacked by the Arabs who were intending to destroy us. And when you look at the way Israelis are raised in terms of the, the, their education, and, and Jews around the world in many places too, um, in many cases, it fits perfectly with the theme of Jews being a persecuted people everywhere. Jews were persecuted in Europe for, for, for centuries upon centuries, and the Nazis came, and then the Arabs came. There's a, there's a continuity to it that makes perfect sense. So you don't need to look back at the details, you accept it, because this is kind of the story. And then, of course, the, the continuation of the end of the story is that, of course, we prevailed, because we were stronger, and we held the moral high ground, and we were smarter, and here we are today. But when you take a look at what happened between the end of 1947 and the end of 1948, that 12 month period, it, you see a completely different story. The picture that you see is it completely doesn't fit with this myth. In a period of 12 months, the smaller Jewish community was able to conquer almost 80% of the country, displace almost a million civilians, and destroy almost 500 towns and cities and villages. And some of these towns and villages were over a thousand years old. With great historical value. Completely wiped off the face of the earth. In a period of 12 months, that's a huge accomplishment considering they were being attacked. If they were being attacked, how did they have time to do all this? You would have, think, you would have thought that they'd be spending all their energy defending themselves, defending the borders. 
And then you start talking to Palestinians and you start reading people like Ivan Pabio and other Israeli historians that began taking a look at what, what actually took place and you see that this is a completely different story. Between 1940, the end of 1947 and the end of 1948, what actually took place was an ethnic cleansing, a well-planned, well-executed campaign of ethnic cleansing and the state of Israel was built, was established as a result of massive forced exile destruction, massacres, and basically the wholesale looting of an entire nation. And that is how the state of Israel was created. And again, like I, like I said earlier, when I stand here before you and, and say these things, it's hard enough, but imagine the moment when you come to realize this. Sitting with people, you know, like yourselves, in kind of a normal setting, and hearing the stories, and little by little by little, you come to realize that the story that you grew up believing is a complete myth. About to say a lot. And much of, of the identity of the Israeli is based upon that, being the David and the David Goliath uh, story. Because without that myth, without us having been being able to overcome um, against impossible odds, there's something missing. Now I'm going to jump forward 20 years to the next myth. So the next myth is what happened in 1967. Once again, the story is that the small state of Israel was attacked by three massive armies intending to destroy it. And again, somehow miraculously, because we were smart, and because we were well trained, and because we were determined, and because we held the moral high ground, we not only prevail, but we destroy them. And once again, you hear about the Kabiz, and you hear about David and Goliath, and you hear about all these stories that are part of the Jewish consciousness. This makes perfect sense. You know, this is who we are, and this is what happens to us. So it makes perfect sense. It follows very well. But then you hear the stories that people tell, and you see, you begin to see that this doesn't completely fit. And in working on the book, what I decided to do, I decided to go and take a look at the Israeli, uh, Israeli army archives. Now, a lot has been already written about those months, the year, the months, and the weeks leading up to the 1967 Middle East War. A lot has been written about it, there are documentaries. One excellent documentary that I recommend is called Six Days in June. There's really, really a lot that's been, and I read it and I've seen it, I think all of it. Uh, but I decided to go into the archives because I wanted to see it you look at the minutes of the, of the actual meetings, you see the names of the generals and exactly what they say. You know, when it's your father, it's a very special moment. You see, you know, General Pellet said this, General Rabin said this. You know, you see the dialogue. It's very much alive. And there was one thing that I found that I hadn't heard or seen in anything else that was published about this anywhere else. When there was... When the generals were discussing this, the point that my father makes several times, and the other generals, is that the Arab armies are actually not prepared for war. And this is going to be a terrific opportunity to attack and destroy them. Now think about it for a second. The myth is that we were attacked by these massive armies that were planning to destroy the state of Israel. And here the generals themselves, in the meeting, are saying over and over again, there's no threat. The Arab armies are not, are not prepared for war. This is an opportunity to destroy them. Now, it's, there, are several interesting, there are several interesting aspects in how this developed. I won't get into all of them. Um, but there are two power groups in Israel. There were the generals and there was the cabinet. Now, the Israeli cabinet did not want war. They, were, they wanted to, you know, there was because the conflict was, was with Egypt. The Egyptians uh, violated the agreements the, the ceasefire agreement between Israel and Egypt, and that's why there was a cause for war. And the government, the cabinet wanted to resolve this somehow diplomatically. And the general said, no, why? We have an opportunity here. Let's destroy them again. And you had this tug of war that went on for days and days and days, or actually for several weeks, between these two power centers. And when you look at them, at the characteristics of the two groups, it's very interesting. The cabinet members were all in their mid-60s, all but one were born in exile in Eastern Europe. They all went through the pogroms, and they still remember the persecution of Jews. 
and mind you, this was maybe 20, 25 years after the Holocaust, and they saw another Holocaust, they saw the possibility of another Holocaust if there was war. The generals were in their early 40s. Almost all of them were born in Palestine. They were all members of the Haganah, the Pomak, you know, the Jewish militia. They were this new, strong, assertive kind of uh, young Jews. And they were prepared for war. And they knew that they had, that, that militarily, they had the upper hand. And it was a meeting on June the 2nd, 1967, it was a very, very important meeting where these two power groups met. And the cabinet came into the army headquarters, which is interesting. And in this, it was a very, very strong meeting. And, and my father says to the prime minister over and over again, he says, why do we have to suffer this humiliation of your hesitance? We have destroyed these armies before. We have never lost in battle. Why, what are we waiting for? Why do we need to wait? We will be victorious today. We will be victorious in six months because the Egyptian army is not prepared for war. But why are we waiting? They couldn't wait to start the war. There's no talk about an existential threat. There's no talk about any threat. Quite the opposite. The threat, the Egyptians put themselves in danger by coming closer to the Israeli army. Well, this is completely the opposite of, of the myth. Completely diametrically opposed. And that particular aspect of it, although so much has been written and, and said about this period, that particular aspect of it I've never seen anywhere. That they actually, the generals themselves, say over and over again that the Arab armies are not prepared for war, this is an opportunity for us to destroy them. And as we all know, of course, the, uh, the, the generals won, and the Israelis began a preemptive strike against Egypt, destroyed the Egyptian army in a matter of days, and then went on to take the West Bank and the Golan Heights, two areas that the Israelis wanted for many, many years because they had water and they had hills and they were at good, good land and so on. And in six days, it was all over. In six days, and it was all, well, let's see what happened over those six days. We're talking about Israel having defended itself against an existential threat from invading armies. Well, let's see what took place. In six days, Israel managed to triple its size. Triple its size in six days. It took the Golan Heights, it took the West Bank, it took the Gaza Strip, and it took the entire Sinai Peninsula. It managed to destroy, completely and entirely destroy three armies. And when you look at the casualty count, the casualty count, the Arab armies suffered somewhere around 15,000 casualties. The Israeli army suffered 700 casualties. 15,000 dead on one side. 15,000 people dead in six days. And 700 dead on the other side. The imbalance is, uh, is more than striking. It's unbelievable. So who exactly attacked who, and who was preparing for war? Now, of course, from the Israeli point of view, this was, this was, this was massive. This was wonderful. You had the West Bank, all these biblical cities that you know Jews always dreamt of, Hebron and Bethlehem and Shiloh, and all these wonderfully sounding biblical names. The old city of Jerusalem, of course, which was the crown jewel of it all. Massive amounts of water, massive amounts of land. And this, of course, was a great victory. Now, on the very first meeting of the Army General Staff after the war, the very first meeting of the Army General Staff after the war, my father said this. He said, we now have an opportunity for the very first time to solve the Palestinian problem. He said, we are now face to face with the Palestinians with no other Arab countries between us. And if we maintain the occupation over the Palestinians, there's sure to be resistance. The Israeli army will be used to quell the resistance and turn into an occupation army with disaster of moral results for the army and for Israeli society. And yes, we all want Hebron, and yes, we all want Bethlehem, and yes, we all want these wonderful places to be part of the state of Israel, but for the sake of the future of our state, for the sake of the future of the Jewish state that we created, we must come to an agreement with the Palestinians. And this is really the very one of the very first times that the notion of the two-state solution based on a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza began to come up. And of course, everybody thought he lost his mind and ignored him. He just conquered all his land. 25 years after the Holocaust, the Jews, for the very first time, 
have their entire land of Israel in their hands. How can you possibly talk about getting into that? So that was that was the beginning of a, of, a, of a separation of my father from the rest of the establishment. Several years later, while well, he retired a year later, and he this is for the, the, the remainder of his life, this was what he dedicated himself to. The just solution, or, or the, what he perceived to be the most just solution to the Israeli-Palestinian problem, which was the two-state solution for the Palestinians create their own independent state in the West Bank and Gaza with East Jerusalem and so forth. And he actually became an advocate for Palestinian rights within Israel, for Palestinians who are, who are citizens of the state of Israel. Now the third myth that I encountered as I was traveling in Palestine and as I was writing the book, the third myth is that Israel is a democracy. The myth of the Jewish democracy. And when you travel around Palestine, and when you begin to meet Palestinians, and you begin to realize how things work, there's no question that Israel is anything but a democracy. Israel has created a situation where it governs three different sets of the population, with three sets of laws, all governed by the same government. All governed by the same government. In other words, the entire country, all 10 or 11 million people who reside between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean are all governed by the same government. In other words, it's one state. But they govern using different sets of laws. So if you're an Israeli Jew, like I said earlier, if you're an Israeli Jew, you live in a democracy. Complete democracy. You can say what you like, you can do what you like, you can come and go. You're a VIP, you have a VIP pass. If you're a Palestinian who's a citizen of the state of Israel, there's an entire culture of discrimination. There's an entire culture of racism that you have to deal with on a daily basis. And there are over 20 laws in the Israeli law books that discriminate against the Palestinians who are Israeli citizens, or the citizens of Israel who are Palestinian. They're about a million and a half. For example, I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, a, a Palestinian, uh, Israeli Palestinians, Palestinians who live in Israel, a young couple cannot get a mortgage. Cannot get a mortgage. Can you imagine a young couple wanting to start a life not getting a mortgage? Cannot get a mortgage. Not to mention get a job, get an apartment in Tel Aviv, I mean, things that we would take for granted. Cannot get a mortgage. Um, and, 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 and on and on. It's entirely by the Israeli military. There is no law that protects them. There is no place where they can get where they can go to uh, to get protection. An Israeli army commander decides to blow somebody's house, they will blow somebody's house. They decide to throw somebody in jail in the middle of the night, they will go in at 2 o'clock in the morning and throw them in jail. They decide to shoot and kill, they shoot and kill. They are above reproach. And the Palestinians who live in the West Bank and Gaza have no one to turn to. And that is the third part of the population, and that is the third set of laws. So you got three, you got an entire country, three different types of sets of population governed by three sets of laws, which is why so many people call it an apartheid state. People are governed based on who they are, not by the law, not based on the law. Based on their identity. Now, the state of Israel has created three systems with which it deals with this. There's an education system, and this is a question that comes up a lot. How is it that Israeli soldiers or Israeli young, young Israelis who look like they're just, you know, normal human beings, grew up in the kind of Western society. What happens to them when they put the uniform, they go in the West Bank, and they become monsters? What happens to them? How does this happen? How is it possible that one moment you look at a kid, and they're perfectly nice and normal and polite and sweet, and the next moment they are monsters? They can shoot a child with no problem. And the, the, the answer to that is the Israeli education system. And it just so happens that my sister, who's an educator, teaches at Hebrew University, just came out with a book on how Palestinians are portrayed in Israeli textbooks. And it's about the racism in Israeli textbooks. And it's, uh, it's hair raising material. It's been, I think it just came out several, a couple weeks ago, a little bit after my book. 
So the Israeli education system is a textbook racist education system. I'll give you a couple of examples. The, 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 the textbook that my sister examined were history books, civics books, and geography books. And you look at, and you look at some of the maps that are um, presented in the Israeli geography books. So first of all, the land of Israel is always what it is portrayed. It's not the state of Israel. It's the land of Israel. And the land of Israel is, of course, the entire country from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. And then, for example, you'll have population groups. So you have Jews and non-Jews. These are the population groups. You have, for example, universities. And so you see the map. It's the entire map. And you see all the Israeli universities. Not a single Palestinian university or college is mentioned. I believe there are 12 Palestinian universities. And they do mention the, 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 the Jewish colleges, the Israeli colleges in the West Bank. The names of the Palestinian cities are never mentioned. You have Tel Aviv, Haifa, never mind Haifa, some of the Israeli cities are Palestinian cities, but originally, but you don't have Hebron or Bethlehem or Ramallah. And so the, 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 the impression that Israelis to cool kids get is that there is no other people here. However, when they are portrayed, they're portrayed as a threat. There are these people who want to take our homes. There are these people who want to push us into the sea. There is a threat out there. So Palestinians are either non-existent, or if they are existent, it's a threat. Well, when you're 18, you're given a gun, and you take, you're told that you need to defend our, your people against this threat. And now, of course, there's a big wall, which makes the threat even more real, and so on. And so this is, so this is how the education system prepares Israelis for the day where they will be able to serve. The other, uh, uh, the other system is a bureaucracy. There's an entire bureaucracy in Israel, an entire massive bureaucracy, the sole purpose of which is to make life impossible for Palestinians, to create restrictions and demand permits, and grant more restrictions and demand more permits. One Israeli human rights lawyer, Michal Sfar, calls it mountains of, mountains of restrictions and oceans of permits. <laughs> The life of Palestinians, and I'm sure many of you I know many of you know this, whether they want to go to school, whether they want to go to work, whether they want to go to their land, is impossible. God forbid if a Palestinian from Jerusalem wants to marry a Palestinian from the West Bank, life is impossible. And then the kids, are the kids from here or the kids from there? They've created an impossibly monstrous bureaucracy for the purpose of making life impossible for Palestinians. And of course, the people who work in this bureaucracy were brought up with the Israeli education system. And then the third arm of this, of this uh, so-called democracy is the Israeli army. And I would categorize the Israeli army as probably one of the best fed, best trained, and uh, best armed terrorist organizations in the world. Without a doubt. The Israeli army is a terrorist organization. Its, it's whole purpose is to terrorize the Palestinians, to get rid of them and to terrorize them. And when you look at the, and you look at the, at the at where, where do you see the Israeli army? You see them in checkpoints, which are there in order to make life hell for Palestinians. You see them in the middle of the night when they come in and arrest, uh, they can come in and arrest a 14-year-old at 2 o'clock in the morning, knock the door down, destroy the house, take the kid away. Nobody knows when they're going to see him again. You see them at, uh, a protest, a nonviolent protest, a nonviolent resistance, shooting and killing and, and beating up uh, nonviolent unarmed protesters. And then in larger, larger what they call operations, like we saw in Gaza at the end of 2008, where they conduct massacres without even blinking an eye. And I'm sure many of you remember this, at the end of December 27, 2008, 11:25 in the afternoon, the Israeli Air Force began carpet bombing in Gaza. And on the first day of a 21-day assault, they dropped 100 tons of bombs from the air. Now, a one-ton bomb will destroy a city block. Gaza is very small and very densely populated. Can you imagine 100 tons of bombs? On the first day, that was not the end. That was the first day. Then after several days of this, the ground forces came in. And I don't know if you saw, but you can see pictures 
of the ground forces preparing to enter Gaza, you see rows and rows of tanks. And you think, what, what are all these tanks for? Who do they expect to see, the Russian army in there? And then you realize, Israelis never think of the fact that Palestinians do not have an army, never had an army. Palestinians never had a tank, never had a warplane, never had a warship, never had an artillery battery, battery, ever. There's never been a Palestinian army. Yet, they used massive, massive force against an entirely civilian population. And this is the Israeli army, and that's why I think it's a terrorist organization. This is what the Israeli army does which is exactly what my father warned about almost 50 years ago, 45 years ago. And with these three arms, Israel conducts its, 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 uh, you know, its day-to-day activities and maintains itself. Now, there are a couple of other interesting things. For example, the water. You see there's a sign there about justice is the, is, is the right to water. Um, all, the entire water supply is managed and distributed by the Israeli Water Authority. Now, one of the largest water reservoirs is in the West Bank. And Israel sells to the Palestinians. The Palestinians have to buy this water. Now, the way the water is distributed is like this. Israeli, Israelis receive 300 cubic meters of water per year. OK, listen to this. 300 cubic meters of water per year per person for Israelis. Palestinians, depending on exactly where they live, get somewhere between 35 and 85 cubic meters of water per year per person. Some between, you know, very, very, I mean, the comparison is, 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 is absurd. But it gets worse. The Israeli settlers in the West Bank. The Israeli settlers in the West Bank get 1,500 cubic meters of water per person per year. More than anybody. So that's why you drive around the West Bank. You see these communities, these kind of gated communities with European style villas and green lawns and a bunch of swimming pools, and uh, Palestinian villages with no water. No water, and they often shut the water down, completely shut the water down for days. Now, when Ilan Pape at the time wrote his book, Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, people were up in arms about how could he use the term ethnic cleansing. The truth is that ethnic cleansing of Palestine began in 1947, but it continues today. The process of ethnic cleansing became more sophisticated and more violent over the years. It's true, they don't pick up half a million or, or 800,000 people and, and throw them out anymore. But the bureaucracy and the army and the water supply and the way life has made hell for Palestinians day to day on a day to day basis is exactly an ongoing ethnic cleansing. Now one of the questions that I hear often, and I'll, so I'll, I'll address it before, before I'm asked, is what happened to me? How did I make this transition? So of course, the fact that my father became, became a, a, an advocate of Palestinian rights was a big part of that. But before that, I remember as a child, my mother telling me a story about 1948 that I'll never forget, and I talked about it in the book. I said she was born and raised in Jerusalem. And in 1948, the, the uh, Palestinian neighborhoods in West Jerusalem uh, were cleared from Palestine, you know, cleared from the population, ethnically cleansed, and the homes were looted and given to Israeli families. And my mother was 22 at the time, she had two young children, my father was fighting in the front, and so she was offered one of these homes. And I don't remember what age she started telling me this story, but she told me this story many, many times. And she would say how she, she couldn't bring herself to take the home of another family. She said, how could I possibly take the home of another mother or another family? They're sitting out there in a refugee camp somewhere, missing their home, missing their land. And she recalled how as a child, she would always, on, on Saturdays, on weekends, she would walk, go for walks through these beautiful neighborhoods, beautiful homes, with beautiful gardens, and, and all the homes were still there. And she couldn't bring herself to take the home of another family. Now, it seems it's, you know, 22, it's, 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 it's quite a big deal to, to come to that realization, especially considering the fact that her education and my education was such that Palestinians and Israelis were never, were never equal in anything. We were always better. We had more rights. It was okay for us to take their homes. It was okay for us to throw them out. It's okay for us to kill them because we are right. We have a right to come back to our land. 
And suddenly she placed the Palestinians on, on an equal footing, equal setting with Israelis. Um, and then of course, like I said, the work that my father did with Palestinians, again, we, you know, we have the right to have our own state and so on. This was in his mind. And, but that doesn't mean we should live in a double standard. We should, we should afford the same rights to Palestinians. Again, Palestinians and Israelis were placed equal. So in my mind, there was never this sense that we were better, that we had more rights. In my mind, there was always a sense that we were equal and we need to resolve this as equals. The problem is, Israelis and Palestinians were never given the opportunity, were never actually placed in a, in a position where they can talk to each other as equals. That has never happened. I'll give you another example. Um, some of you may know this, but in, 19, in 1997, my sister's daughter was killed in a suicide bombing in Jerusalem. When two Palestinians pulled themselves out, she was downtown Jerusalem, she and several others were killed. She was 13 years old. And um, of course, this was big news because she was the granddaughter of this famous general, but not only was he a general, he was a general that now liked Palestinians. He became an Arab lover, and now, see what they did to him? This was the this was the, this was kind of the sense of it all, and uh, when she finally came out of her room after the funeral and everything, and her apartment was packed with reporters and and, and people who came to, to express sorrow and so on, um, she was asked, "What do you say about retaliation? And what do you think should be done to these Palestinians who did this?" So she said several things. First of all, she said, "Don't talk to me about retaliation." She said, "No real mother would want this to happen to another mother." Number one. Number two, she says, I point my finger not at the Palestinians, who, by the way, took their own lives in the process. I point my finger at the Israeli government who placed them in a position where they were brought to such despair that they could take their own lives and take the lives of other innocent civilians. This is a level of despair that we as Israelis brought them to. And we have ourselves, only ourselves to blame. By the way, Netanyahu, who was now prime minister, was prime minister then. And then talk about comparison, or being, you know, being on equal footing. The two, the two young men that killed her, her daughter are dead. Israeli pilots, Israeli soldiers that kill Palestinian children on almost a daily basis know for a fact they will never be charged. We have a close friend, and I talked about it in the book, Basam Aramin. His daughter was 10 years old, walking home from school, and she was shot in the head by, a, by an Israeli sniper. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. This is a trial that has been going on for years. Nothing. The soldier will never, ever be touched. And, and, and people know who he is. He will never be touched. So talk about the lack of equality. Talk about what kind of democracy this is. But Israelis and Palestinians were really never placed in a position where they were equal. Not in terms of water, not in terms of rights, not in terms of their um, the future that, that, this, that, that the country offers them, not in terms of their dead, not in terms of anything. So where do we go from here? And this is, of course, the big question. And I finished my the, 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 the last chapter of the book talks about well, where we go from here. And the debate is, of course, one state, two state. I call it chapter one state, two state, three states. And the two-state solution was something that came about in the late 60s, mid-70s, and then kind of gained ground, and you know, the 80s and the 90s came, and it was Oslo, and everybody thought, well, this was actually going to be a good solution. And then after Oslo fell apart, people said, well, you see the Palestinians, they were not willing to do any more, you know, they were not willing to um, give any more concessions, and therefore the whole thing fell apart. So it was a good idea, but the Palestinians blew it. But let's look at it again. Let's look at this myth again. Talk about, you know, if you, uh, demystifying these things. When the Palestinians first began talking about the two-state solution, it was in the, in the mid-1970s. My father and several other Israelis began this dialogue with PLO representatives, people that were Yasser Arafat's closest aides, closest, aides, closest people, to start working on this notion of a two-state solution based on the West Bank and Gaza being a Palestinian state. Let's talk about the concessions for a moment. What Arafat was willing to do was give up almost 80%, 80% of the 
of the Palestinians' historic homeland, give up the right of return to their homes, that the you know, they give up the right of the refugees to one day return to their homes, all for peace. Provided they were given the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem, 22% of their land. And when Arafat died in 2004, I wrote a piece in San Diego in the paper, and I, you know, everybody was vilifying him, and he, you know, because you know, he died. There was Israeli tanks surrounding his, his uh, compound, and he died as a villain, supposedly. He was the most consistent voice for peace in the Middle East for 30 years. He was the most consistent voice for peace in the Middle East until the day he died. He, he, he was willing to make peace based on the two-state solution, but nothing less. And when they tried to push him to give in more to what Oslo was supposed to create, which is this kind of a Bantustan uh, situation, he said no. And that's why he was vilified. So in terms of the concessions, the concessions Palestinians that have always been willing to, to give were far more than anything Israelis were ever willing to give. And perhaps, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, maybe even the 90s, the two-state solution was a workable solution. The reality is the two-state solution solves no problem other than the people who live in the West Bank and Gaza, if it worked out perfectly. The reality is that no Israeli government, not even the most liberal Israeli government, was ever willing, or will ever be willing, to allow the Palestinian or Palestinians to stay in the West Bank. Zionism is completely, completely in, 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 uh, incapable of compromising on the land. So the best they were willing to do was give them a few, a little bit of autonomy in Ramallah, a little bit of autonomy around a few of the cities. That's it. Not East Jerusalem, not the Jordan River Valley, not the major uh, settlement blocks. In other words, a very, very small part of the West Bank. This is the best any Israeli government, the most liberal uh, Israeli government would ever be willing to give the Palestinians. That's why I think the only solution is a solution whereby the Zionist state is not part of the solution. The Zionist state cannot be part of the solution because the Zionism is completely contrary to any kind of compromise. And when you have two people who share the land, compromise, there's, without compromise, there will not be a solution. Now, the way the structure is built, the way the state is built, it's already one state. There is one state governed by one government. Only half the population gets to vote. Only half the population has the resources. But everybody is governed by the one government. Everybody that lives in that, in that one state is governed by the same government. It's already one state. The transformation that we need to look for is a transformation from this apartheid system to democracy. From the apartheid system to a complete equal rights. And equal rights means an equal voice. It means uh, um, access to resources, access to water, compensation, right of return, all the decisions need to be made by the two, by representatives of the two sides as equals. Without that, there can never be a solution. Now, people like to describe this as, and I, I, I read this uh, anywhere somewhere, you know, people like to describe it like, like, two, uh, like two children in the playground. They need to get along, and you know, they need to get along, America and the adults don't need to intervene. But that's not the reality. The reality is you've got a kid who's a lunatic with a loaded gun terrorizing everybody in the school. So do the adults need to step in or not? Does somebody need to put an end to this lunatic with a gun with a loaded gun? And that is exactly the reality. That is exactly the reality. And the only way to do this, the only way to do this is to step in. Now there's lots of ways to step in, I won't get into it right this minute. But the end result has got to be the end result has got to be complete equal rights. The end result has got to be the transformation of this racist apartheid state into a real democracy. And then, and then, and then, you know, Israel, Israel is a beautiful place. Palestine is a beautiful place because it's the same place. It's a beautiful place. It's very promising. It's got a rich history. Um, you know, Israelis and Palestinians are very similar. If this room was filled with Israelis and Palestinians, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. They're similar in education levels, they're similar in economic levels, socioeconomic levels, although of course Palestinians have less resources right now. They both have a lunatic fringe of, of religious fanatics that they both hate. 
They both had a, uh, um, kind of a ruling rich class of corrupt politicians and corrupt millionaires that they both hate. And there's a lot in common in the middle. There's a lot in common in the middle. There's a lot that can be done once the people in the middle, once the Israelis and the Palestinians can work together as equals. And therefore, that is the, that's, the, that's the conclusion of, my, uh, of the book. And that's, and that's really the conclusion. And to that end, you know, I do what I do and I speak the way I do and so forth. So,